This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Souls of Black Folk by W. E. B. Du Bois. Music and Text Recorded by Toria's Uncle. Chapter 11 Of the Passing of the Firstborn. O oh, sister, sister, thy first begotten, the hands that cling and the feet that follow, the voice of the child's blood crying yet, who hath remembered me? Who hath forgotten? Thou hast forgotten, O summer swallow, but the world shall end when I forget. Swinburne Unto you a child is born, sang the bit of yellow paper that fluttered into my room one brown October morning. Then the fear of fatherhood mingled wildly with the joy of creation. I wondered how it looked, and how it felt. What were its eyes, and how its hair curled and crumpled itself? And I thought in awe of her. She who had slept with death to tear a man-child from underneath her heart while I was unconsciously wandering. I fled to my wife and child, repeating the while to myself half wonderingly, Wife and child, wife and child, fled fast and faster than boat and steam-car, and yet must ever impatiently await them. Away from the hard-voiced city, away from the flickering sea, into mine own Berkshire hills that sit all sadly guarding the gates of Massachusetts. Up the stairs I ran, to the wan mother and whimpering babe, to the sanctuary on whose altar a life, at my bidding, had offered itself to win a life, and won. What is this tiny, formless thing, this newborn wail from an unknown world, all head, and voice. I handle it curiously and watch perplexed its winking, breathing, and sneezing. I did not love it then. It seemed a ludicrous thing to love. But her I loved. My girl mother, she whom now I saw unfolding like the glory of the morning, the transfigured woman. Through her I came to love the wee thing as it grew strong, as its little soul unfolded itself in twitter and cry and half-formed word, and as its eyes caught the gleam and flash of life. How beautiful he was, with his olive-tinted flesh and dark gold ringlets, his eyes of mingled blue and brown, his perfect little limbs, and the soft voluptuous roll which the blood of Africa had molded into his features. I held him in my arms after we had sped away from our southern home, held him, and glanced at the hot red soil of Georgia and the breathless city of a hundred hills, and felt a vague unrest. Why was his hair tinted with gold? An evil omen was golden hair in my life. Why had not the brown of his eyes crushed out and killed the blue? For brown were his father's eyes and his father's father's. And thus in the land of the color line I saw, as it fell across my baby, the shadow of the veil. Within the veil was he born, said I. 
and there within shall he live, a negro and a negro's son. Holding in that little head, ah, bitterly, the unbowed pride of a hunted race. Clinging with that tiny dimpled hand, ah, wearily, to a hope, not hopeless but unhopeful, and seeing with those bright wondering eyes that peer into my soul a land whose freedom is to us a mockery and whose liberty a lie. I saw the shadow of the veil as it passed over my baby. I saw the cold city towering above the blood-red land. I held my face beside his little cheek, showed him the star children and the twinkling lights as they began to flash, and stilled with an even song the unvoiced terror of my life. So sturdy and masterful he grew, so filled with bubbling life, so tremulous with the unspoken wisdom of a life but eighteen months distant from the all-life. We were not far from worshipping this revelation of the divine, my wife and I. Her own life builded and molded itself upon the child. He tinged her every dream, and idealized her every effort. No hands but hers must touch and garnish those little limbs, no dress or frill must touch them that had not wearied her fingers. No voice but hers could coax him off to dreamland, and she and he together spoke some soft and unknown tongue, and in it held communion. I too mused above his little white bed, saw the strength of my own arm stretched onward through the ages, through the newer strength of his, saw the dream of my black father's stagger a step onward in the wild phantasm of the world, heard in his baby voice the voice of the prophet that was to rise within the veil. And so we dreamed and loved and planned by fall and winter and the full flush of the long southern spring till the hot winds rolled from the fetid gulf, till the roses shivered and the still stern sun quivered its awful light over the hills of Atlanta. And then one night the little feet pattered wearily to the wee white bed and the tiny hands trembled, and a warm flushed face tossed on the pillow, and we knew baby was sick. Ten days he lay there, a swift week, and three endless days wasting, wasting away. Cheerily the mother nursed him the first days and laughed into the little eyes that smiled again. Tenderly she hovered round him, till the smile fled away, and fear crouched beside the little bed. Then the day ended not, and the night was a dreamless terror, and joy and sleep slipped away. I hear now that voice at midnight calling me from dull and dreamless trance, crying, The shadow of death, the shadow of death. Out into the starlight I crept to rouse the grey physician, the shadow of death, the shadow of death. The hours trembled on, the night listened, the ghastly dawn glided like a tired thing across the lamplight. Then we two alone looked upon the child as he turned toward us with great eyes and stretched his string-like hands, the shadow of death. And we spoke no word, and turned away. He died at eventide, when the sun lay like a brooding sorrow above the western hills, veiling its face, when the winds spoke not, and the trees, the great green trees he loved, stood motionless. I saw his breath beat quicker and quicker, pause and then his little soul left like a star that travels in the night and left a world of darkness in its train. The day changed not. The same tall trees peeped in at the windows, the same green grass glinted in the setting sun. Only in the chamber of death writhed the world's most piteous thing, a childless mother. I shirk not. I long for work. 
I pant for a life full of striving. I am no coward to shrink before the rugged rush of the storm, nor even quail before the awful shadow of the veil. But hearken, O death, is not this my life hard enough? Is not that dull land that stretches its sneering web about me cold enough? Is not all the world beyond these four little walls pitiless enough but that thou must needs enter here, thou, O death? About my head the thundering storm beat like a heartless voice, and the crazy forest pulsed with the curses of the weak. But what cared I within my home, beside my wife and baby boy? Was thou so jealous of one little coin of happiness that thou must needs enter there, thou, O death? The perfect life was his, all joy and love, with tears to make it brighter, sweet as a summer's day beside the Housatonic. The world loved him, the women kissed his curls, the men looked gravely into his wonderful eyes, and the children hovered and fluttered about him. I can see him now changing like the sky from sparkling laughter to darkening frowns, and then to wondering thoughtfulness as he watched the world. He knew no color line, poor dear. And the veil, though it shadowed him, had not yet darkened half his sun. He loved the white matron, he loved his black nurse, and in his little world walked souls alone, uncolored and unclothed. I, yea, all men, were larger and purer by the infinite breadth of that one little life. She who in simple clearness of vision sees beyond the stars said when he had flown, He will be happy there. He ever loved beautiful things. And I, far more ignorant and blind by the web of mine own weaving, sit alone, winding words, and muttering, If still he be, and he be there, and there be a there, let him be happy, O fate. Blithe was the morning of his burial, with bird and song and sweet-smelling flowers. The trees whispered to the grass, but the children sat with hushed faces. And yet it seemed a ghostly, unreal day, the wraith of life. We seemed to rumble down an unknown street, behind a little white bundle of posies, with the shadow of a song in our ears. The busy city dinned about us. They did not say much. Those pale-faced, hurrying men and women, they did not say much. They only glanced and said, Niggers. We could not lay him in the ground there in Georgia, for the earth there is strangely red. So we bore him away to the northward, with his flowers and his little folded hands in vain, in vain. For where, O oh God, beneath thy broad blue sky shall my dark baby rest in peace, where reverence dwells and goodness and a freedom that is free? All that day and all that night there sat an awful gladness in my heart. Nay, blame me not if I see the world thus darkly through the veil. And my soul whispers ever to me, saying, Not dead, not dead, but escaped, not bond, but free. No bitter meanness now shall sicken his baby heart till it die a living death. No taunt shall madden his happy boyhood. Fool that I was to think or wish that this little soul should grow choked and deformed within the veil. I might have known that yonder deep, unworldly look that ever and anon floated past his eyes was peering far beyond this narrow now. In the poise of his little curl-crowned head did there not sit all that wild pride of being which his father had hardly crushed in his own heart? For what, forsooth, shall a negro want with pride amid the studied humiliations of fifty million fellows? Well sped, my boy before the world had dubbed your ambition insolence, 
and held your ideals unattainable, and taught you to cringe and bow. Better far this nameless void that stops my life than a sea of sorrow for you. Idle words. He might have borne his burden more bravely than we. I and found it lighter, too, some day. For surely, surely this is not the end. Surely there shall yet dawn some mighty morning to lift the veil and set the prisoned free. Not for me I shall die in my bonds, but for fresh young souls who have not known the night and waken to the morning. A morning when men ask of the workman, not, is he white, but can he work? When men ask artists, not, are they black, but do they know? Some morning this may be, long, long years to come. But now there wails on that dark shore within the vale the same deep voice, thou shalt forgo. And all have I forgone at that command, and with small complaint, all save that fair young form that lies so coldly wed with death in the nest I had builded. If one must have gone, why not I? Why may I not rest me from this restlessness, and sleep from this wide waking? Was not the world's alembic time in his young hands? And is not my time waning? Are there so many workers in the vineyard that the fair promise of this little body could lightly be tossed away? The wretched of my race that line the alleys of the nation sit fatherless and unmothered, but love sat beside his cradle and in his ear wisdom waited to speak. Perhaps now he knows the all-love and needs not to be wise. Sleep then, child. Sleep till I sleep and wake into a baby voice and the ceaseless patter of little feet above the veil. End of chapter 11